In this lesson, you are going to understand the concept of unsupervised learning. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to explain the mechanism of unsupervised learning, use different clustering techniques in Python, Overview Unsupervised learning is a machine learning technique used to train the machine learning algorithm using data that is either unclassified or unlabeled and allows the algorithm to act on that data without guidance. Unlabeled data is a designation for pieces of data that have not been tagged with labels identified by characteristics, properties, or classifications. So the flow of unsupervised learning starts with training data that has no labels and depends on the feature vector. The machine learning model defines the predictive model. This is tested with an individual subset of data with its own feature vector. Here, the predictive model defines the likelihood or cluster ID or a better representation of unlabeled data. Let's look at the difference between unsupervised and supervised learning. Supervised learning technique deals with labeled data where the output data patterns are known to the system. Unsupervised learning works with unlabeled data in which the output is just based on the collection of perceptions. Supervised learning method is less complex. The unsupervised learning method is more complex. Supervised learning conducts offline analysis. Unsupervised learning performs real-time analysis. The outcome of the supervised learning technique is comparatively more accurate and reliable. Unsupervised learning generates moderately acute but reliable results, while classification and regression are the types of problems solved under the supervised learning method. Unsupervised learning includes clustering and associative rule mining problems, example, and application of unsupervised learning. Let's understand unsupervised learning through an example. Consider a scenario where a child had no learning phase and is shown images without the labels. Now, if the child is asked to identify if any range is a bird or an animal, he will lack the information that can help him do so. The best he can do is come up with the following groups based on common patterns, wings and legs, for example. This explains how unsupervised learning works. We show a lot of data to our algorithm and ask it to find patterns in the data by itself. Let's look at the application of unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning can be used for anomaly detection as well as clustering. To understand clustering, let's look at a simple real-life example. A mother asks her two children to arrange the pieces of playing blocks. The children come up with two different groups as shown with different similarities in the blocks. This is clustering. Each of her children came up with a different type of grouping. One child grouped them based on the shape, whereas the other grouped them based on the color. There is no right or wrong way. Then, how can you pick one set of clusters over the others? This will depend on the similarity measure used by the mother in this case. The arrangement of child 1 is better than child 2 if the similarity measure chosen by the mother was that blocks should have the same shape. However, the arrangement by child 2 is better if the similarity measure chosen by the mother was that blocks should have the same color. Therefore, defining the similarity measure is important when performing clustering. There may be different ways in which data can be arranged in different groups based on size, shape, color, texture, and other complex features. Anomaly detection is a clustering technique used to identify unusual patterns that do not conform to expected behavior. Anomaly detection has many applications in business, such as intrusion detection, system health monitoring, and fraud detection. Clustering The method of grouping similar entities together is called clustering. The goal of this unsupervised machine learning method is to seek out similarities within the data points and to cluster similar data points together. Need for clustering Let's look at the need for clustering. Grouping similar entities together helps to merge the attributes of different clusters. In other words, this gives us insight into underlying patterns of different groups. 
There are a lot of applications of grouping unlabeled data. For example, in order to maximize the revenue, you can identify different groups or clusters of customers and market to each group in a different way. Another example is grouping books together that belong to similar topics. Clustering is needed to determine the intrinsic grouping in a set of unlabeled data, organize data into clusters that show internal structure of the data, partition the data points, understand and extract value from large sets of structured and unstructured data. Types of clustering. There are two types of clustering, hierarchical clustering and partitional clustering. Hierarchical clustering can be agglomerative and divisive, whereas partitional clustering can be k-means and fuzzy c-means. A distinction among different types of clustering is whether the set of clusters is nested or unnested. A partitional clustering is just a division of the set of data objects into non-overlapping sets or clusters such that every data object is in just one subset. A hierarchical clustering is a tree structure that has a set of nested clusters. Hierarchical clustering. The output of hierarchical clustering is a hierarchy. How does the hierarchical clustering form a hierarchy? Assume you are going to create a three-layer hierarchy from six different data nodes. So first combine A and B based on similarity and also combine D and E based on similarity. Combination of A and B is combined with C. In the similar way, combination of D and E is combined with F. Now combine C and F inside one cluster. When you look at the final tree, it contains all clusters combined into a single cluster. Let's understand the working of hierarchical clustering. It works in four steps. Step 1. Assign each item to its own cluster, such that if you have n number of items, you will have n number of clusters. Step 2. Merge two clusters into a single cluster by finding the closest pair of clusters. Now you will have one cluster less. Step 3. Compute distances between the new cluster and all old clusters. Step 4. Repeat steps 2 and 3 until all items are clustered into a single cluster of size n. Let's understand the distance measure in hierarchical clustering. Let's look at the different kinds of linkage in clustering. Complete linkage clustering. It finds the maximum distance between points belonging to two different clusters. Single linkage clustering. It finds the minimum possible distance between points belonging to two different clusters. Mean linkage clustering. It finds all possible pairwise distances for points belonging to two different clusters and then calculates the average. Centroid linkage clustering. It finds the centroid of each cluster and calculates the distance between them. What is dendrogram? It is a tree diagram frequently used to illustrate the arrangement of the clusters produced by hierarchical clustering. It shows the hierarchical relationship between objects. It is most commonly created as an output of hierarchical clustering. The main use of a dendrogram is to work out the best way to allocate objects to clusters. The dendrogram also shows the hierarchical clustering of five observations and the relationship between each of them. Hierarchical clustering example. Let's understand hierarchical clustering through an example. In the given example, hierarchical clustering is used to find the distances between the different cities in kilometers. The following matrix traces a hierarchical clustering of distances in miles between different cities. The method of clustering is single link. Here, as you can see from the given distance matrix, the nearest pair of objects is TO and MI. MI and TO are merged into a single cluster called MITO. As MI column has lower values than TO column, MITO consists of MI column values. MITO column has one index with zero value. This is because there is no distance between cluster MITO and MITO. To get a new distance matrix, we compute the distance from this new cluster to all other clusters. Now the nearest pair of objects is NA and RM. These are combined into a single cluster called NARM. 
To get a new distance matrix, we compute the distance from this new cluster to all other clusters. In the similar way, the nearest pair of objects is BA and NARM. These are combined into a single cluster called BA, NARM. To get a new distance matrix, we compute the distance from the new cluster to all other clusters. Similarly, now the nearest pair of objects is BA, NARM, and FI. These combined into a single cluster called BA, NARM, FI. To get a new distance matrix, we compute the distance from this new cluster to all other clusters. Finally, we merge the last two clusters. This process is summarized by the clustering diagram on the right and the final distance matrix on the left. Demo Clustering Animals Problem Scenario Consider the dataset Zoo.Data and look at the information provided in the first five rows. The first column denotes the animal name and the last one specifies the high-level class for the corresponding animal. You are supposed to find a solution to the following questions. 1. Identify the unique number of high-level classes. 2. Perform agglomerative clustering using the 16 intermediate features. 3. Compute the mean squared error by comparing the actual high-level class and the predicted high-level class. In a nutshell, you just have to perform agglomerative clustering with the appropriate MSE value. Let's import the required libraries and the data set. Since we have now loaded the data set, we will extract some basic information from it as our first step. With the info command, it is clear that the data set has 18 columns in total and 101 entries. Also, there are no null values. Let us now proceed towards the first question, which is extracting the unique number of high-level classes. Most probably, the unique function from numpy will help. We can plot the unique number of labels obtained using the matplotlib library. Create a figure and a set of subplots. From the plot, it can be seen that we have seven unique class labels. Now, since we are about to group animals based on their features, it's clear and quite predictive that clustering should be performed. Let's now extract the features, leaving the labels column and store them in another data frame, say Features. Import the necessary modules for performing clustering. Specify the number of clusters as 7. Note that here we are specifying the total number of clusters as 7 because there are 7 unique class labels. Also specify the linkage method as average and the similarity method as cosine. Fit the agglomerative clustering model over the feature variable defined earlier. 
Let us extract the labels predicted by our model against the features. We can see that we have predicted labels against all of our 101 animals. Although we have seven labels, but it is numbered as six, so in this case, we can subtract one from our original label column such that it matches the predicted numbers. Now let us move ahead and predict the accuracy of our model considering the predicting parameter as mean squared error. Now evaluate the absolute error by applying square root operation on the mean squared error. Print the resultant error. The root mean squared error we got is 2.43 approximately, which is quite acceptable. Now that we have clustered the animals, let's quickly recap the steps we have covered. Import libraries and the data set. Check for missing values. Identify unique labels and plot them. Extract features necessary for clustering within a single variable. Fit agglomerative clustering model on the feature data. Predict labels for each animal. Print the RMSE of the model. K-means clustering. Let's look at the steps involved in K-means clustering. K-means is an iterative clustering algorithm whose goal is to find local maxima in each iteration. This algorithm works in these four steps. Specify the desired number of clusters K, randomly assign each data point to a cluster, compute cluster centroids, reassign each point to the closest cluster centroid, and recompute cluster centroids in order to check if the convergence criterion is met. Consider the dots given in the diagram as the data points. First, k-means randomly chooses k-examples, data points from the data set, the three colored points, as initial centroids. This is because it does not know yet where the center of each cluster is. A centroid is the center of a cluster. Assign data points to the nearest centroid. Then, all the data points that are the nearest to a centroid will create a cluster. As you can see, there are three centroids as red, blue, and purple, and all the data points of the same color is one cluster. So in total, we have three clusters now. Now we have new clusters that need centers. A centroid's new value is going to be the mean of all the examples in a cluster. Centers are moving because a centroid will have the value of the mean of all the data points in a cluster. We'll keep repeating steps 2 and 3 until the k-means algorithm is converged, that is, until the centroids stop moving. Optimal number of clusters. Determining the optimal number of clusters in a data set is a fundamental issue in partitioning clustering such as k-means clustering. This requires the user to specify the number of clusters K to be generated. If you plot K against SSE, you will see that the error decreases as K increases. This is because their size decreases and hence distortion is also smaller. The basic idea behind partitioning methods such as K means clustering is to define clusters such that the total within cluster sum of square WSS or the total intra-cluster variation is minimized. The elbow method looks at the total WSS as a function of the number of clusters. One should choose a number of clusters so that adding another cluster doesn't significantly improve the total WSS. It works in the following way. Compute clustering algorithm for different values of K, for instance by varying K from 1 to 20 clusters. Calculate the total within cluster sum of square WSS for each K value. According to the number of clusters K, plot the curve of WSS. The location of bend in the plot is generally considered as an indicator of the appropriate number of clusters. Demo Cluster-Based Incentivization Problem Scenario Lithian Power is the largest producer of electric vehicle e-vehicle batteries. They provide batteries on rent to e-vehicle drivers. 
Drivers rent a battery, typically for a day, and thereafter replacing it with a charged battery from the company. Lithion Power has a variable pricing model based on the driver's driving history. Battery life depends on factors such as overspeeding, distance driven per day, etc. You are supposed to create a cluster model where drivers can be grouped together based on the driving data and to group the data points so that drivers will be incentivized based on the cluster. Let's import the libraries NumPy and Pandas. Import visualization libraries, namely matplotlib and seaborn. Import the warning module. The warning module was introduced in PEP 230 as a way to warn programmers about changes in language or library features in anticipation of backwards incompatible changes coming with Python 3.0. Import metplotlib library for visualization and an instance of RC params for handling default metplotlib values. Please note for the sake of simplicity, we will take only two features. Mean distance driven per day and the mean percentage of times a driver drove higher than 5 miles per hour over the speed limit. Let us go through each of the columns first and understand them. The ID column represents the unique ID of the driver. The mean underscore dist underscore day column represents the mean distance driven by driver per day and the mean underscore over underscore speed underscore purse represents the mean percentage of the times a driver drove higher than 5 miles per hour over the speed limit. Let's start with using pandas to read driverdata.csv as a data frame called df. We will now use the info command to check the number of columns in total and entries. Also, this will let us know if we have any missing values. In addition to it, we will use the describe function here to check the count, mean, and median values for each column. Now we will import k-means from sklearn.cluster and run the algorithm with k equals 2, which is the minimum number of clusters that can exist in a data set. Also, let us create an instance of the k-means model with two clusters such that it becomes easier to call the same later. Please note that we have dropped the ID column as it doesn't have any reference in forming clusters. Let's now fit the model to the data. The algorithm is now fitted on our data and you can claim that it has created the clusters. Let us now use some commands to get some information on these clusters. We will use the command cluster centers from k means to determine the cluster center vectors. Use the labels underscore command along with print to display the labels. Also, we can go for the length of those labels. Now let us check how many unique drivers are there in the first and second cluster. We will set the theme as white grid as it is better suited to plots with heavy data elements. 
Plot the clusters using the lmplot function from the Seaborn library such that we have mean underscore dist underscore day feature on x-axis and mean underscore over underscore speed purse on y-axis. We can clearly see from the graph plotted that there are two clusters, one centered around 50 mean distance delay and the other around 175. Also, we can see that there are more drivers in the cluster with the delay centered at 175. Since K means clustering gives optimum results when iterated multiple times, let's try out the same with increasing the number of clusters, say four. Print the cluster centers with four clusters and track the four unique labels along with their frequency of occurrence. Zip the unique number of cluster and their frequency counts within a dictionary. We can clearly see the difference now in cluster centers. Also here we have a distribution of data points in each cluster. Let's now plot the same. Such that we have mean underscore dist underscore day feature on x-axis and mean underscore over underscore speed purse on the y-axis. From the four cluster plot we can see that it's denser compared to the two cluster plot and hence more optimal. Now that we have clustered the data with the k-means, let's quickly recap the steps we have covered. Import libraries and the data set. Fit the k-means model on the data set. Evaluate cluster centers and labels. Plot the clusters to see the distribution of data points. Iterate the same by changing the number of clusters to four. Again, evaluate the cluster centers. Plot the clusters to see the distribution of data points. Draw inference out of both plots. This brings us to the end of unsupervised learning. You are now able to Explain the mechanism of unsupervised learning. Use different clustering techniques in Python. Hi there. If you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.